Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another exciting interview on the Vinnie Eastwood Show, broadcasting live from New Zealand. It's really, really gorgeous down here. When you look at the movies that have been filmed here, instead of looking at the videos that I film on the streets and listening to the interviews that I do with the activists who know all the crap that's going on with it. <sighs> See, there's the Hollywoodization uh, uh, kind of effect. Oh, there's, there's all these friendly Māori people in grass skirts shaking around and pointing their tongues out at us all phallically. It's really not nice. But, uh, yeah, bro, look, I've got some... Um, some very interesting stuff to uh, talk about with you here. My very special guest is Dr. Nick Begich. Hi, Dr. Nick. Hey, how are you? Good to be with you today. I'm borderlining on fabulous. And and yourself? I'm doing very well, thank you. All right. Well, especially considering what you know about how to uh, expand your consciousness, that should that should be. Uh, that should be the case, and if it's not, it's false advertising. But anyway, we're today we're go. talking about <laughs> mind effects and what you right. can do to alter your state of awareness for various purposes. Right, right. You know this uh, this whole area of um, mind effects has taken you know a lot of different directions in, in, in my research over the years, and you know the, the I think the biggest. Uh, Revelation, if you will, when you dig through you know, sort of all the sinister side of of this from the government perspective, what's happened, like the MK Ultra that I, I'm sure most of your listeners are aware of, and you know these older programs that took place, you know, over many decades and and actually continue even to this day. Uh, the idea of being able to manipulate uh, the human mind and, and now under the guise of, of programs like. Um, Get, you know, things to get rid of post-traumatic stress syndrome from uh, from the wars and conflicts in the world. You know, basically by wiping your uh, your memories clean. That's kind of the extreme side of it. But there's a lot of other things sort of in between, and that are I think very interesting from the standpoint of enhancing even performance. Things that can enhance um, meditation, uh, focused uh, learning, relaxation. Um, you know, these kinds of things. Things that can really benefit. Uh, humankind right now. I mean, if you think about what's happening uh, within the world, a, a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, I think all of us would agree on that. And and with that comes an inability, uh, an impossibility of reaching uh, higher states of consciousness or the better um, places to make those intellectual and creative decisions. Because quite frankly, in those states of awareness or consciousness, you can't get there. Uh, your mind won't... Um, allow you to bridge there. You can't. You just flat can't get there. The, the way the brain works and the way the uh, brain activity is it becomes very incoherent, um, non-rhythmic sort of patterns, whereas when you're experiencing um, a focused uh, learning, for instance, or when you're in the zone as an artist or in these very special states of awareness, you see rhythmic uh, patterns in the brain that are associated with this higher order um, thinking, reasoning, um, maybe connecting to uh, an infinite source of uh, knowledge, perhaps. Well, I, I do find that when I'm uh, when I'm jamming, uh, I can come up with like whole new songs and, and, and things like that, and they just sort of come out of nowhere in the moment. Right, right. That's exactly what I'm talking about. This is uh, what, what I would what I would say is um, when you uh, contemplate sort of what's happening in the technology from the standpoint of human performance, uh, what's being learned and has been learned for military applications, really the biggest issue that comes from that research is this altered state, uh, this uh, way of uh, awareness that allows you to, to function at a higher level, like what you were just talking about with music. You know, when you go into that zone, that creative zone, it's the same zone that every artist goes into or a speaker or whatever it is that your, your passion is, you, you sort of fall into that um, rhythm of communicating it, of connecting with it. And at the same time, if you look at your brain activity, you be very low stress. Your breathing is probably really, really deep and healthy. I mean, your whole consciousness shifts and, and it's measurable. When you're in fear and anxiety, it shifts, but shifts differently in, in the wrong direction. And, and not even directional so much as it becomes incoherent. It, it follows the uh, flight or fight kind of response on that basic sort of reptilian brain sort of kicks in for survival. Whereas uh, when you're in these 
states of um, a little bit of detached awareness, if you will. You're focused. You're able to concentrate. You're you're doing things that you you, you are really remarkable, quite frankly. And this is a uh, the state of awareness that we should be in is our sort of normal state. And instead, we're in this, you know, kind of constant state of anxiety and fear. And I mean, think about how the commercial world comes at you, identifying all of the things that can go wrong, whether it's, you know, all the drugs that are pitched at you or the deodorants or toothpaste or mouthwash or, I mean, I don't care what it is, it's geared to build on anxiety and insecurity and then amplify that, which is really destructive. Uh, in, in so many ways, very simple form of, of mind control, if you will, is even even that, uh, because in those states you can kind of get herded along as opposed to a, a different way of being. At the same time, think about television uh, programming and think about the person sitting in front of the TV, totally focused, and their and their spouse is hollering at them, "Hey, hey, dinner's ready," and they're not not even aware; they don't even hear it. It's because. They're in a light state of trance. They're actually watching a television, and the flicker rate of the of the screen brings about a um, a, a response that you uh, actually fall into this light trance-like state, and you're literally being programmed. You're not watching the program. You're literally being programmed by uh, the messaging that's that then coming through in a much more, um, and you're in a much more state of receiving. And that's why advertising is so effective, and that's why television is so addictive, and that's why um, some of us turned them off quite a few years ago uh, for, for that very reason. Yep, uh, ours is under the house uh, gathering, <laughs> gathering <laughs> right, dust that... and mildew like it deserves. Son of a bitch. Right. <laughs> um, what was you it? Know, I was going to say, even, you know, I mean, movies are fine. I mean, people should entertain themselves, distract themselves from time to time, but. Really think about your information feed, you know, and how it comes at you, and and then make some decisions. You know, even the the way the information feed is is constructed, and this goes back to things we were writing now twenty years ago, and now it's here, and it's essentially by gaining a a, a very relevant and very fine screen resolution of each individual based on their contact points with the World Wide Web and information storage systems that take data about you and store data about you that's commercially traded and sold and marketed. And, and what ends up happening is the profile on every living soul becomes higher and higher resolution to the point where now um, fairly easily uh, systems can, can view you as well as someone that's lived with you for 20 years and predict what you're going to do better than you will predict for yourself. And that's the state of the technology. So when you think about sort of how we interact with electromagnetic medium and what that yields on a lot of you know, different levels, from the basic propaganda to full profiling that then allows you to tailor messages so that the 99 messages you're not going to agree with will never hear. But the one, your tendency, your profile will tell uh, people that you want to do something or a predisposition the push is on. Uh, and, and think about this in terms of politics. 100 issues, 99 you disagree with, but you only hear the repeat on the one, delivered in just the right fashion and form that you're going to receive it. Be careful with your news feed, how you access it, where you get it, and how you determine what's relevant. Because it really is at an increasing level becoming sort of the first line. And the fear injected by modern media. Um, that needs to be watched very carefully because it shuts down our ability to make the kind of changes that are necessary to retain the republic and, and to retain our form of uh, human interaction. In fact, think, think about this for a minute, and, and everyone will ID with it even more and more as the years go on, but you know, walk through an airport and you see a family of one-year-old, three-year-old, five-year-old and parents, and they're all staring at a screen. They might even be talking to each other for all you know, through that screen, but whoever they're talking to, whatever they're doing, it's interfaced through a machine. No longer face-to-face -face communications, no longer connection, and all the data is sort of scraped off and retained by somebody. Uh, not that they'd ever use it, <laughs> but what a, you know, really, you know, I mean, come on, this is really a changed world for lots of different reasons, and what we think of as liberty has 
become um, the noose around our neck unless this generation sort of changes the way we see the world and the way the world interacts with us as, as human beings. Because right now, it really is um, a, a form of very subtle mind control on a cultural, economic, social, uh, and um, a, a physical level for well, sure. And, I'll, and I'll, give you an example. I'll give you an example of the physical level, like what I'm wearing right now. I've got cuffs around my wrists, a collar around my neck, and a noose around my throat. <laughs> well, you know exactly what I'm saying. I mean, from the standpoint of uh, surveillance and technology and then how it's used to play us, this is the big challenge. And, and, and here's the thing about it is people ask me all the time, well, what do we do? You know, and, and the first thing is you don't you got to let go of the fear they associated with just the way the 21st century operates. And contemplated in a context, you know. Uh, I mean, in the West, we're still way better off than most of the world that thought Armageddon happened a couple couple millennium ago. You know, try living in Mumbai, you know, and not think it's bad news. But the world is changing in lots of different ways. And I think this is the um, revolution in the evolution. You know, when you start to see technologies emerge that man is duplicating, it's also really a reflection of what we already are. And what so much of the technology and the research in this area has shown me is these um, things that are discovered in the course of all this research about humans, it generates a fair amount of fear in military circles when they stop and think about the idea of system protection when people can see right, you know, right into someone's brain. So they have contracts. Uh, in the University of California right now, DARPA does too. One for reading minds and one for sending signals or essentially transferring thought. And the way they're planning to do this is looking at complex signals from human brains and mapping them and then, in, and then overlaying those on other brains and seeing if you can literally transfer these complex waveforms that are perceived on the, uh, it, within and outside of the skull and see if that transfers thought. So there's a lot of things going on in the area. Um, where man is sort of trying to duplicate. In fact, uh, PBS did a public broadcasting here in the U.S. did a big special on the worldwide mind, which is this idea that what we're doing with the internet with wires will eventually do wirelessly brain to brain. Now, that's a profound thought if you stop for a moment and think about it. I mean, the idea of uh, communicating that way, I think we actually do, and there's some research that would support that. But more importantly is an interface, this is a dangerous thing in my view, the idea of another interface to sort of suck not just what you're writing about or speaking about, what you're thinking. This is a shift in gears that I think all of us should be cognizant of as a, as a century moves forward. Oh, sorry, we had this um, talk about uh, FFR, frequency following response. You yes. Know, what and is that? Well, this is exactly... Um, uh, what I was alluding to earlier about the idea of uh, these external signals, and here's how it essentially works. You can use a flickering light that pulses um, at, a, at a rate of, say, between 0 and 50 hertz pulses per second. And by modulating it within a certain bandwidth, you can, you can sort of force the brain. The optic nerves will carry this pulse signal in, and the brain will begin to mirror the signal frequency following the response. And as such, its brain state will change. So if you want to hit... For instance, that state of uh, highly focused learning, that lower alpha range, you can dial it up at about 7.8, 7.9 hertz, maybe 8 hertz, and you're right there in that zone, and you have a uh, flickering light essentially driving you there. Or you can use um, a modulated uh, magnetic field like an electric current, or you can modulate a signal on any carrier, for that matter. I'm trying to make be, a movie. Right. And let's say I want this movie to really, really grab people and sort of control them in a way and, and make them leave the theater going, oh, my God, I'm going to I'm going to I'm not going to sell death sticks. I'm going to go home and rethink my life. <laughs> you know, like, could you actually get some kind of Jedi mind trick up, up in there? Well, you could affect a lot of people's thinking in this way um, with a lot of different messaging, depending on how you frame it and how you how you pack it. And this is exactly what I'm saying. It's not that difficult to do. In fact, I would, I would believe that it's this frequency following response. Everybody who studies psychology in the 21st century understands it. 
And for advertisers to not apply it, you know, it seemed a little derelict in the advertising kingdom. But as a practical matter, I think it's uh, a scary thing when you stop and think about it because it's simple as that. You don't need to move everybody, but, you know, you move enough of the market, it makes advertising pay now, doesn't it? And Or propaganda pay, I should say, because that's what that becomes. And the idea of utilizing these technologies in this way is exactly um, what I believe is happening because there's no restriction on it for the most part, and certainly it's a certain advantage to, to, to recognize it. At the same time, I think it's the biggest invasion of personal privacy and liberty and something that needs to be looked at in the broader sense uh, of what personal freedom means in the 21st century, beyond the surveillance debate that seems to be going on forever, you know, 25 years of it, we're still no safer from uh, misuse of our data than... Uh, the Nazis kick in your front door of your house in. In fact, it's worse because your digital doorway today is a much different ball game. This is where your information is housed. If, our, if in this country our founding fathers had, had the uh, forethought to even know something like this could exist, it would have been safeguarded. We would own that data, not commercial enterprises, government, and others. We would own our own data because that is our digital doorway to the 21st century and our route to freedom. You know, the fact that Technology is outpacing the discussion of what is reasonable within um, within our cultures and our societies around the world, and, and that's what's not being um, analyzed, I think, uh, appropriately. But the idea that we're reaching these other uh, places in our evolution, this is what was what I find amazing. The idea that frequency following responses um, can also be used in various uh, therapies for training individuals to control the brain activity like hyperactive children or children whose brains are operating too slowly and have attention deficit disorders of different kind. But you can actually teach children within 40 sessions, about an hour apiece, how to modulate their brain activity in such a way that they don't need chemicals, Redolin and these other psychoactive drugs that are destroying their uh, kidneys and livers over the long term. But you know, you can actually teach them to modulate their brain in exactly the right way to reach exactly the right state to learn. And this is something most um, so-called normal people can't do. But this is what the technology offers everyone, whether you want to learn that, that particular zone for meditation or concentration or relaxation. You can literally learn it in, in a matter of weeks, something that may take uh, a Zen monk 20 years to figure out. And, and that's the state of the technology now that's commercially available beyond what militaries have evolved and, and other technologies have evolved into. And you so just see inklings in that media. That conceivably, if we were to modulate a signal that was coming out of a device and specifically tailor it to uh, somebody's state of mind right now, and we could actually change their state of mind to something else. Yes. In fact, Persinger at Laurentian University um, made it even simpler. He said, you know, it'd be as simple as like having a normal news broadcast with a normal press release, hacking up some group like maybe Muslims as being the villain behind everything. And then you just modulate a signal over the airwaves. It creates a central, general state of disorientation and anxiety and tension and uh, maybe even a little anger. And that gets directed a certain amount in that propaganda feed. And you can do it right through the medium itself, through the television or radio broadcast, by carrying a modulation that does this. In fact... Can you detect this happening? Like, could you, could we, we, we like, for example, turn on a, a feed of mainstream and or alternative media right now and just sit there and watch them and just detect whether or not there's a feed go, going on? There? Not necessarily. You'd have to look at the signals, the actual signals coming off the sound signals and look for submodulations on those carriers, and that's where you'd find it. And that might not be so easily perceived, certainly without... Uh, full-spectrum equipment that could take and look at each of those signals coming off of that broadcast. But this is what's interesting, is this shows up in a couple of places. The U.S. Army War College uh, quarterly perimeters did an article on this called The Mind Has No Firewalls. Very interesting article. Uh, it was really a replication of an earlier article from Orienteer, a Russian journal. But we cite over, I think, 300 sources uh, in the book Controlling the Human Mind that sort of lay out where this technology is, where it came from, and, 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 and physiologically how it interacts with the human system. Uh, and, and in fact, what they've, what they've done with 
a lot of this technology, just figure out a way to couple, to kind of join with the human system and override those signals that flow between brain, body, um, and, and, and create our thoughts or our states of at least emotional states. And, and they can alter these relatively easily by just changing um, signals, creating different chemical reactions within the brain that you know, give us a sense of euphoria or anger or whatever other emotional um, drama needs to be dumped in. And this is not so difficult to achieve. Uh, the idea of voice information, like what people are hearing coming off of the sound system or listening to us talking today, uh, can be um, sent in with uh, an acoustic heterodyning developed by Woody Norris, who won the MIT Lemelson Prize um, back maybe 10 or 12 years ago now for this technology, where you could take a, two signal generators and point them at an individual in a crowd and deliver the proverbial voice in the head that They'd say, hey, do you hear it? Do you hear it? And everybody around them would go, hear what? You know, they wouldn't hear anything. It'd be that crazy guy hearing the voice in the head. Technology's existed over 12 years, been recognized with a half a million dollar prize from one of the best technical institutes in the whole world, MIT, uh, to Woody Norris. Look it up. You'll see it. And, uh, you know, there's just one area of technology. It, it goes back 50 years and continues to advance dramatically. And these technologies I'm talking about already are a dec over a decade old. So would it be fair to say that they've probably got a lot more advanced stuff now uh, that nobody actually knows about? It's probably classified and weaponized. I, I would say so on, on, on the basis that technology doubles about every 12 to 15 months. That's from the invention, the wheel, to where we are at this moment. And to think that that area of technology stood still would be pretty naive, in my opinion. Uh, you know, the fact is, a lot of research, a lot of money has been thrown into these areas um, for essentially controlling populations. And the danger is too much of our society's our military and security apparatus are so classified that even the Congress in the U.S. can't take experts in, cannot ask questions outside of the hearings, and cannot take notes. Now, my brother was a U.S. senator, my dad was a U.S. congressman, and I can tell you, them or their colleagues do not even have the basic science knowledge to ask the right questions to get the answers. So what happens is you've got no technical people in scrutinizing when they're getting these dog and pony shows, which is exactly what they are, uh, to appease the Congress as the bureaucracy marches on. And this has become, over decades, um, that hidden government that people fear, because what Eisenhower warned about here was, uh, you know, the technical society was basically his warning, you know. And this is on steroids. These guys, their science fiction is a joke. Because it all already happened, so it's not even interesting anymore. But the fact of the matter is, we're so far beyond where that was anticipated, the impact it would have, and the impact it has had. Take a look at the problems in this country, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Europe, in Asia, in, in Latin America, I don't care where you are, with its own unique cultural overlay, it's the same globalists, it's the same nonsense, and the same technology, military, industrial, academic complex that is devouring um, freedom in the world. I mean, in, in my opinion. And this is sort of the pinnacle of it, in my opinion, as well. Are you talking about this ability to broadcast this stuff through signals and actually change and have an effect on people at a uh, population-wide yes. level? Now, uh, yes. what, means, what means they'd be putting that out? There would be essentially every airwave, every wirelessly accessible device, you know, conceivably, or, or what are we talking about here? Well, you could utilize any of those things as a carrier. It just depends on who you're trying to reach and what your intention is. But you can use uh, modulate signals in the ionosphere that will carry a hemisphere. You can modulate um, signals over a wireless system of any kind, radio, TV, or a hardwired system like t hardwired telephones um, or cable networks. Anything that you can modulate a signal, essentially you can change at least emotional states and maybe more complex things as our ability to generate and duplicate um, these signals uh, become. There's been a, a number of films that have come out recently where the, the bad guys will have some kind of technology that, that is uh, embedded in a signal like on a phone or something and it makes people go crazy and start killing each other sort of thing. Well, I mean, again, you know, can you trigger uh, chemical changes within the brain with an external signal? And the answer is absolutely yes. 
And here's the thing. The, the, the Air Force, in a, in a publication called Technology Horizons, which the electromagnetic director of the Air Force, I think it was June 2004. It could have been a year either side of that. But you can look it up. And, and they had an article on controlled effects. Now, what they said is where they wanted this to be about now <laughs> is to the point, <clears throat> and I believe they're here, is where they can control hardware, you know, uh, be able to override electronic circuits on hardware, um, even cause them to burn out. It, we've achieved that kind of technology, high-powered lasers, uh, high-powered um, uh, microwave weapons of various kinds. The, the, the other is this kind of um, controlled effects where you just affect the software, the flow of those electrons through those complex circuits. So it's more of a pulsed energy, they decided. It was a big surge. It's like a hammer, like a little mini electromagnetic pulse that knocks those electrons crazy and the software fails and the apparatus malfunctions. And the third is the human operator, the ultimate control effect. And the idea there is to control all five uh, external sensors, uh, sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, uh, all those things that allow us to visualize, including our vision, um, an experience. And so they would be able to create experience sets as an objective of that program, according to the article, or eliminate experience sets. Now, I, I don't know what most people feel about that, but I find that very disturbing. The idea that you could remove and replace a memory set. What happens to things in trials where testimony matters and guy gets up and swears to it? That's his memory. You know, 30 years from now, what about education? You know, that we no longer treat kids to critically think. We just dump whatever we believe they ought to know and believe. These are the challenges that these very technologies that we're talking about today present for this generation, because that is the outcome, and we have to decide who controls the data feed uh, into your next generation brains and your own, well, yeah. and quite frankly, this is really the essence of it. Yeah, it is. And and the other question I've got here is about the side effects, right? Like, if there's a deliberate effect to actually try and um, alter somebody's mood, what about the variations on the side on either sides of the bell curve? There might be some people who respond very, very strongly to it, and some people who don't respond to it much at all. And there's also right. probably a whole bunch of unknown unknowns. You right, know? Right. Things that might actually, You're right on. You're exactly are, are right. Are going to be like cooking people's are, are people's brains being cooked? right now by the, because they're watching TV, things like that? Well, let's, let's say this. Um, when you're altering consciousness in a constant state of anxiety and fear, it affects your physiological body. I mean, it affects your adrenals, it affects your heart rate, it affects your breathing, it affects your digestion, it affects your root that causes, gee, stress-related illness. You know, make the list. You know, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer. Uh, bad eating habits because of digestion. I mean, on and on and on. That's the uh, reflection of all of this. So is it creating damage? Yeah, I, I would say so. The idea of is it, is it impacting culture? Uh, take a look around. Um, I don't care where you live. Is it, you know, I mean, is it impacting culture? And what, are we kidding ourselves? It, it is the culture. A uh, reality culture. TV star is the President of the United States. I guarantee you there's some guy out there who is in a coma, and they woke him up and they go, Donald Trump's the President. And he's like, nah, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I'd like to meet the guy, because he's got to be in bigger shock. Because we are all boiled slowly in the cooking pot of life as, as these kinds of things um, happen routinely. I mean, all over the world, things are happening that are highly disturbing to people within those environments. And how it's being reported is even more bizarre, but it's a story for another day. You know, what, what I would say is, you know, the, the entire um, thing uh, in terms of dehumanizing people, which is ultimate effect of all of this, it takes away from us um, the essence of what we are because we're created to be created. You know, we're meant to do these unusual and outstanding things. And, and living in fear and anxiety does not take us there. And, and most of what we fear most, if you stop and contemplate it for a moment, never, ever happens. It just never does. And, and yet people live in that state rather than being productive and living in a state that's simple as choice. And, and I think the impact of sort of the brain driving side of it, you know, keeping people sort of knocked off um, their center all the time, there's advantage, I guess, from a marketing perspective. Uh, you'll gain some advantage, uh, but in the bigger uh, 
scope of humanity, we have these huge potentials. And that's what the other side of the military sort of discovery was, was that we all had these anomalous human capabilities. We used to refer to them as extrasensory perceptions, you know. And they, they went, oh, wow, everybody has this. If they can figure it out, you know, we can't have that happen. Uh, because, you know, a transparent government is one that would create revolution in virtually every country on the planet because of the scale and depth of um, maybe not in the purest sense of corruption, but certainly things not working in our interests uh, would upset a lot of people, and, and as it should. And so I, I think the day is dawning, and this is what, what has blown me away about the best science minds in the world on this topic, which I have had the opportunity to meet uh, many of them. And their view is that this is the next evolution of humankind, to reach this awareness, this remembering of what of what, what we latently have within us. Uh, and then the game dramatically changes. That's where the real revolution, uh, the next evolution begins, which, you know, I mean, to hear that from a dozen top scientists uh, around the world as sort of their projection on what's coming, it's a bit reassuring, in my opinion. At the same time, I'm sure very disruptive and disheartening uh, to those that have a lot to hide and a lot to worry about. Mm -hmm. and, and and when you think about it, you know, maybe that's um, Judgment Day, the day that we are transparent before each other and we have to be pretty forgiving of ourselves and each other on that day, I would imagine. I'm uh, uh, mostly of the opinion that it's good to use the weapons of the enemy against them sort of thing like if they're if they're capable of doing this then um what if you could instead of put giving somebody anxiety and fear you're giving them comfort and joy and creativity well you you can deliver that but here's how that goes because that can't be imposed on someone else or it's just as ugly as the other thing hmm. it has to be um stimulated in someone else so they can intrinsically internally find that that and then you can change uh, outcomes. But if you impose happiness on someone, how is that any different? I mean, come on. It's the imposition of your will on another's and assuming that their unhappiness they don't deserve to have. And, you know, uh, stop for a moment and contemplate that for a minute. The best things ever happened to you, I would bet, where you learned the most in life were not those pleasant, wonderful bonbon days. They were when you were getting your ass kicked. Well, two two and things. Um, <laughs> the, the the most valuable lessons are the ones that cost you the most, and yes. the most painful lessons are the ones you remember the most vividly. And what this means yeah. is that you won't remember the good times. That's why you have to live them every day. Right. I agree with that, too. And this is where it has to be intrinsic, internal. And uh, how you perceive those things that you've learned in life and how you index them is, is, is vitally important. But for, the, for someone to uh, believe that they should impose on anyone happiness any more than fear, uh, the imposition is the problem, not the necessarily the emotion. And I think that's what, uh, it's, it's a free will question, you see, because no one in most traditions, most religious traditions, even God doesn't have the right to impose his will on the living soul. And here we are as human beings going, well, you know, we know that guy really needs to be happy. Let's make him happy. No. Uh, that's any what's more so than... dangerous about it is because for the first time ever, like that's this age-old question, I can't control what somebody else thinks. Now you freaking can! Yeah, well, there you go. And so the temptation, and this is, uh, there's a book uh, by Zbigniew Brzezinski, who many remember, found one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission. It was called Between Two Ages. And go, go find a copy of the book and, and around between page 54 and 56, read them. And he's talking about the very technology of mind control kind of stuff we're talking about now. And what he said is, in, in this book, is it didn't matter who was in charge, liberal or conservative, the temptation to use it, you know, to further their political plans would be greater than the good sense to restrain and they might have different rationales. You know, one might be about order and control. One might be about making everybody happy. And you know what? They're both wrong. I mean, it's like, hey, there are some things we should not do. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. You know, it's like a little kid. You know, should you touch that fireplace the second time? Probably not a good idea, you know, but he might just do it. And, and that's where humans are, I think, in the state of developing a very dangerous technology. Speaking do we of play what? or do we not? 
we're in this dangerous environment in the medical field at the moment where uh, informed consent, right, is, is essentially right. non-existent. And I think the same kind of parameters of informed consent really uh, revolve around this technology. If, if it were to ever be used on you, you should know about it and have knowingly consented to it, right? This very good point. In fact, it was Secretary of Energy O'Leary during the Clinton administration who made that point in the context of saying that over a half a million Americans have been used in human experiments without their consent over a 50-year period. Now, that was a while ago, and that's what they admitted to. A half a million Americans, and you know what? Nobody's in jail. Nobody's in prison. Nobody's been held accountable in front of a court of their peers for violating the rights of a half a million Americans. You want to know what's been going on the world? Well, we got a little heads up on the torture, or the transit for torture programs and the dig through your trash so we can extort and blackmail you programs, and some of the other felonious acts of the American government committing around the world uh, under the guise of national security. And securing what? Our American values, and that's a reflection of them. I mean, I don't even know that many people that have committed that many felons as our government. <laughs> I don't generally have felons as my friend, uh, and, and yet that's my government, and, and everybody else is too, quite frankly, and, and it's been that way for a very long time. And so when I think about these things, um, yeah, there's a reason to be anxious and uptight and stressed out a little bit. But at the same time, it's not a time to be that way. It's a time to recognize what's going on and the truth of the matter and start to incrementally take a little bit of control of our own lives and step back into the game a little bit. Uh, and I think that's a challenge for this century. Is, is that where meditation uh, comes in in terms of taking back control? Yes. Uh, strong systems are resistant to these external forces. They tend to be very light modulations on carriers. Uh, strong systems, you know, ignore them. And you can also detach from them, as I have. Uh, I don't do television. I, don't, I try to minimize some of that, at least. And I think that's helpful. I, I escape to a place where I live that is so remote and removed from the bombardment of um, external stress created by these signals. Think about it from this standpoint, just in the normal culture of it all. We have like uh, over 250 million times more radio frequency energy around us than nature delivered 100 years ago. 250 million times. And now here's what you notice. All the different forms it comes in and all the different power systems that deliver RF and various leakages and forms. When the power grid shuts off in your neighborhood, First thing you notice is you don't hear these irritating fan motors or anything else. It's quiet. Second thing you notice is your whole body just took an exhale. Oh, as you relax a little bit and you notice, wow, I feel almost lighter. Because your whole body has habituated to this bound up constant state of stress because of external signals that your body adjusts to just like a noisy room. You know, a noisy room, you're having a conversation, you black out everything that's not yours. Same thing the body's doing with these external signals. Until you shut it off and you go, wow, what a difference. And the resolution, as I was saying earlier, is where it's at. And that's where you can tune it. You're not just creating stress and anxiety, but actually dialing up things very specific and unique. Uh, that reminds me of when uh, I think there was a airport that they had a radar thing on, right? And this guy was watching his aphids on a, on a plant. And every time the radar wave went through them, they all just started um, tensing up, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's like, whoa. Well, here's the, here's the wavelength is important because whatever wavelength that radar was corresponding to something physiological within those aphids is what triggered the resonance response. It's like... When you dial to the radio stations and you get resonance, harmony between the transmitter and the receiver, everything works. You get a nice, clear signal. People hear our voice if it's coming that way. So when you think about a living organism, whether or an element, a molecule, a cell, a compound of cells, a, a liver, a kidney, a heart, or you know, a whole body, if you resonate the right wavelength, the right signal that will couple with those various elements, which you can do, like tuning a radio. And this is where the resolution is improving. So you can dial up the heart and give a heart attack, or you can stabilize the heart and give it the proper rhythm, or you can 
In fact, there's one scientist I know that developed technology for an external pacemaker. It fits on the outside, creates an electromagnetic field, causes the heart chambers to fire properly, costs about 300 bucks in parts, and they'll have to surgery. And she's a uh, biophysicist, very well-respected, well-renowned. Uh, you know, but there's people doing things with this knowledge that is much more conducive than just shutting the heart off, following it. But so much of the technology has been developed for military applications and is classified as the very things we need to better understand human physiology and health was not because we need to kill people efficiently before we save them. Apparently. Now, uh, the human race extrasensory perception has been kind of like played down so much uh, in, in the media as like oh it's so kooky and, and and that kind of stuff but it's actually very real shit right yeah and it, and, and actually it shows up um again in the in the um literature low intensity conflicts in modern technology by the uh, maxwell air force base 1984 old old now um talked about all of this and and a whole chapter on utilizing, in fact, electromagnetic fields for even triggering what they called anomalous human capabilities. These things we're talking about, extrasensory perception, um, biolocation, telekinesis, all these kind of crazy ideas that people talk about. But the interesting thing is the math uh, has been developed uh, behind that. The physics, the biophysics, that explains sort of how these phenomena work. Uh, one gentleman, he was a former biophysicist, head of the biophysics lab, for the USSR called Academy of Sciences when there was one. And he he did the, uh, Alexander Kaperain and uh, did work in this area. And it, it's interesting because all of these things, and I had him in a closed conference uh, when I was working with the Lay Institute on Technology, along with a number of other experts. And what they were saying as they got into this whole area of mind effects and being able to affect the human mind was, this area of extrasensory perception. And it was Rosalie Bertel from Canada, double PhD in mathematics and physics, um, a radiological expert, used to teach at um, Berkeley, uh, mathematics to biology uh, doctoral students, a brilliant woman, and also a nun. And her statement was that the next evolution of humans was going to be extrasensory perception. These things that the military refers to as anomalous human capabilities. In, the, in their literature, and everyone around the table, a number of physicists, top notch scientists, to my surprise, agreed um, that this, in fact, was the next uh, step for humans. And people were already seeing more and more manifestations of it. And the thing, and how it kind of works is, as you believe it, it, it could become so. I mean, as you suspend your beliefs and say you can't, and as more and more people are convinced you can, uh, you will. And that's kind of the way it works. Um, because it's not about learning something new, it's about remembering something that you are. And this is why it became the biggest threat, too, to modern, hidden society and culture as governments exist today, because they become highly transparent in that world. Um, that's a problem for those so, guys so that we perceive it as such. The dilemma is thus, Lee. If you have an entirety of a population that does not believe that being a slave to uh, scumbag overlords is actually a good (laughs) idea all of a sudden because they remember that they're uh, beings of infinite consciousness with virtually limitless potential in an infinite universe that they they have the capacity to conquer and expand and that kind of thing, that's just not good for business. It isn't, and it and actually only takes one or two guys, as history has shown us, at any given time to really disrupt the status quo. So um, the thing is, this time around, there's probably millions, and uh, and I'm looking forward to the day when we awaken a little bit more. And the technologies um, for transformation are already among us, and the possibilities are already manifesting among us. And, uh, you know, I think it's great, and I think that's really the optimism in me. You know, I, I laugh about it once while I say I'm a pathological optimist, you know, and it's like some, some kind of disease I have. How do you keep smiling through all this? Because I really do believe, um, absolutely with, with full conviction, that to go through the fire that the world will go through um, will purify us as human beings, and we'll be better off for it, and we will have these um, attributes that carry us through, because that's all that um, will do it, quite frankly. Uh, when you think about real change on the planet, it's going to be intrinsic, internal, uh, to each of us. 
And that internal change is going to trigger the landslide that I think we should be looking forward to in the 21st century. Well, let's think about not this, in fear, not in anxiety. This, this internal change, like um, you, you mentioned the words, new, uh, what was it, neurobiofeedback, like brain feedback, right? Right. right. In, in terms right. of meditation. Right. And this is, again, um, let, me, let me segregate a couple different technologies. There's drivers, those that kind of push you there, where you get the, this frequency following response that we had mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's uh, brain biofeedback, which kind of takes a signal and then helps you analyze. There's, like, there's a device that, that's on my website, and it, it has a headband that fits right here. And whenever you're stressed, you have uh, tension in your forehead in these muscles. So it has little muscle tensiometers that pick up the tension in the muscle, give you an audio signal that's a high pitch, and as you relax, the signal goes lower and lower and lower. And you can set the volume to the signal, and you can also set the intensity. And what the, it's, it's called an alpha trainer, and, and you use it for like a month, for a half an hour, 45 minutes a day, to learn how to relax. And you'll be able, within a few days, to be able to hold it to its lowest, most relaxed tone pretty easily. And what you'll notice is your breathing will become rhythmic, your You'll relax for sure, uh, and, and you'll reach that sort of semi-meditative state pretty easily. And, and then if you do this, if you, go, if you if 10 more days you add on and you think what you're doing is think of the most stressful thing, your boss yelling at you, your teenage daughters getting in trouble, whatever. Whatever it is that brings you stress, think about that, and, and then at the same time, try to relax. And what you'll learn is that after... 10 sessions of that and 30 sessions of learning how to use the device, you won't need it anymore. You'll have trained yourself through neurobiofeedback to slow things down, fall into that semi-meditative state of awareness where you're awake. It's that focus zone when you're awake. And then you're making decisions, not out of the tension of um, those stressful moments. You learn how to control it. And this is the same thing can be taught with other tools to ADHD, ADD children, or a biofeedback for being able to learn how to modulate. And so you can learn how to meditate this way, you can learn how to relax this way, you can put your brain in a state where then you can jack in the recordings or other information, you know, language tape, that kind of thing, and accelerate the learning by bringing the brain into its ideal state for that kind of um, information. And then you decide how much information, what information you want to feed it. Or you go into that light trance state where you want to change behaviors and you make a recording of your own voice telling you what you want to do so it's you know you pretty well trust that when it hits you in subconscious it it anchors very well and it gives you a chance to do some things that can enhance your performance as a human being so there's things out there um neurobiofeedback is one of them that's i think very exciting for helping people gain control so that for instance, even emotion. You can have all these emotions triggering uh, from other uh, external sources or your own internal agitation. But a simple way to deal with it, and it's simple, you don't need any tool. You just notice it. Okay, you're feeling anger. If you notice the anger, actually you now control the anger. Now you're in control of it. It's when you don't notice that the anger takes you or the love takes you or whatever emotion it is takes you. Whereas if you stop and notice it, that's all it requires to control it. And, uh, and the same is true if someone's utilizing or government's utilizing emotional uh, control. As soon as you feel that anxiety watching that television show, stop, notice it, acknowledge it, how you control it, turn it off or keep it going. It's your choice then. That's uh, kind of like in a nutshell why I stopped listening to InfoWars. <laughs> <It's like laughs> well, here's how it goes. Uh, I, I was on InfoWars recently, um, did five seconds with those guys, and I can tell you is... Everybody, uh, there's lots of purposes in triggering lots of things in people. And um, the biggest and most important thing to trigger in people is thinking again. And anyone who's doing that, in my opinion, um, is doing good work. Because challenging the non-thinking is the, the task of the 21st century. Not making judgment so much on whether that's a good path to follow or a bad one. I think it's more important... Um, to awaken people to thinking again, and then searching again, and then the ultimate outcome of that is finding again, and then things will change. So anyone doing that, God bless them. <laughs> no matter how it might appear, 
uh, from the outside looking in. That's well, I look I'm at out. it um, as kind of like a gateway drug to the truth movement sort of, sort of thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, know you, you, get, you get yourself onto that <laughs> shit and then all of a sudden you start craving harder stuff, you know, and you can't start coming to the video eastward show. Oh, the lighter side of genocide, mate, doesn't get any more intense than that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's all. I think it's all good and uh, interesting in how it all evolves. And there's a lot to be said for um, the alternative media, quite frankly, because you know when you talk about fake news, and I read the recent surveys, what 60% of people believe the mainstream is the fake news, and you know, they're right. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it is true, and so um, the truth gets out in a lot of different ways, and ultimately, I think it resonates with people. And this is the important thing: is uh, so much information, um, getting through it and deciding uh, what's worth knowing and what's worth doing. And, and I, I kind of bring it down to this. We can engage in any number of things. Find that which you're the most passionate about and then do something in that direction every day. And, uh, and it leads to a very interesting way of living as opposed to a way of being, uh, existing within a structure that's kind of hurting you along. Um, and I think that's the first step to independence. Is, is truly that. That's what the country was founded on, that kind of independent thinking and the idea of possibility. And uh, not the idea of limits and constraint. And, and look how, what, what a nightmare have we seen created around the world uh, from what uh, was hoped for at this stage of our uh, being on this planet, for sure. Well, uh, every nightmare is a wonderful dream when it first starts off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's like, oh, oh god but it just keeps going it just keeps going you know it's like um i i, I don't know uh, what you can really call it but if you've ever taken what was what was it my mate ollie said he said oh we did these superman trips one time bro and they just kept going and going you're like oh man i can't wait for it to be over and then all of a sudden it starts coming down like oh Oh, that's better. It's starting to taper off, and then boom! You know, it starts it starts going off um, even worse than before. And I think life is like that. It's whenever something appears to be too much, it starts to taper off before it starts to intensely come up again. Right? Like the night is darkest just before the dawn. I think that happens. Um, I think that happens pretty frequently, more than we more than we like on a personal, individual level and as a collective uh, country or a group of people. That is a challenge of the 21st century. Dr. Nick Begich, ladies and gentlemen, earthpulse.com is his website. Go and check that one out. And bear in mind, this is a listener-supported broadcast, ladies and gentlemen, on a listener-supported network. So go to the vinnieeastwoodshow.com. That's Vinny with a Y, because it's the most important question. And Eastwood, like, go ahead, make my news. And go ahead, give us a dollar a month through that Patreon, or a few bucks through the Kiwi Bank or PayPal, whichever is easiest for you to support the work we're doing here at the Vinnie Eastwood Show. And go to American Freedom radio.com and flick them a few bucks as well for all the wonderful content and uh, hosts that they bring to the airwaves we'll see you again sometime folks thank you very much for listening and thanks Nick thank you very much for having me